And we are live. All right, guys, you should know before we start the show, this is the very first episode of This Week in Photo that I'm doing with my new microphone, if you had noticed. This I was, new I, I was red ugly. glowing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's I love just it. cool. Yeah, it matches my lipstick. Yeah. It does. Lindsay, I, I brought this mic on just because of your lipstick, so we're, my, we're good to go. And my pen. My favorite color is red, so you've got me one over. That's my favorite color. I, I don't know if this is... I don't know where this is going. It's meant to be. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right, let's do the show, guys. You ready to roll? Do it. Okay, here we go. Starting from the top. And welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me this week to discuss some of the topics, photography-related topics this week and much more, are a new voice and a familiar voice. First, Miss Lindsay Adler joins us, and also Mr. Derek Story. Hey, guys. Hello. Hi there. All right. Uh, Derek, you're a, you're a TWIP veteran, so I'm going to start with Lindsay. Lindsay. You were going to start with Lindsay anyway. <laughs> I would have been. You got me. You got me. No matter what, I would have had an excuse to start with Lindsay. <laughs> so, Lindsay, I interviewed you before for this week in photo, so welcome back as a host. Thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. I can tell this is going to be fun. You guys are quirky. Yes. <laughs> That, that is a good way to describe us. We are very, very quirky, but we're passionately quirky. Maybe that's it. Absolutely. So let's, let's, uh, let's just start with you. So what, what's what been going on in the world of Lindsay Adler over the past several months? Oh, man. Well, I don't even know where to begin. Um, so my fourth book came out um, oh. November 1st. Nice. So that's Congratulations. a new one. Thank you. And uh, I've been shooting a bit. I got to travel this a little bit. I have been prepping for some educational things that I'll be sharing with everybody in the new year. And I tried to reward myself by making December a slower month because I think it's I personally think it's really important to reflect on your year and think about the new year because otherwise they, they blend together and you forget to set goals. And mm -hmm. for me, that's like, I mean, that's essential to my success is like really thinking about what I want because I get pulled everywhere at once. And I mean, I could be the busiest person I know and go nowhere <laughs> because I could just do everything. So you're like yeah, you're like so running. You're moonwalking. You could be moonwalking in quicksand, right? You're just exactly <laughs> staying in one yeah. spot. You're tired, but you're not getting anywhere. Right. right. So yeah, yeah. So that's. I mean, that's what's important to me right now is figuring out what I want out of 2014. Excellent. Well, welcome. Well, hopefully, we'll we'll have your your wonderful voice on this week in photo many more times in 2014. Sounds great. All right. Also on the show, Mr. Derek Story, also known as the Nimble Photographer and the Digital Story and all that stuff. What's going on, Derek? Oh, a lot, a lot. End of year, like Lindsay's saying, you know, thinking about 2014 already. Recovering from last night. Uh, I know. So, what happened last <laughs> night? We were out. We were out uh, at the Warriors game. Doing the Warriors game. It, you know, did you did you realize that uh, they came back from the largest deficit of the year in the NBA, 27 points? So was that of the year? Wow. That was of the year. Yes. Yeah. So oh, look at that. So, you know, I yeah. did feel a little out of place there because I felt like I was the only one in that crowd of thousands with. Wearing Google Glass. You were the only one with Google Glass that I saw. <laughs> I didn't feel cool there, you know. I know Google Glass are awesome, but I just felt like I felt out of place. I don't know what it was. But it was a good test. I mean, that was a raucous environment. So, I mean, we, we got to test a lot of gear there. So oh, I, I yeah. thought that worked out really well. And uh, I'm working on the workshop season for 2014, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to introduce a new one, uh, San Francisco Street Scene. Sweet. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm really jazzed about that. And um, I gotta mention this camera that I'm testing, uh, the Sigma DP2. Is uh, has Sigma the Foveon X3 sensor been on your radar at all? Not yet. Tell it. me a little bit about that. Yeah. You have it? Yes, I do. Ha ha Wait, Lizzie, you, you have this camera? Yes, I do. <laughs> have you, have <laughs> you done the the monochrome processing with it? Have you yes, played with I that? Have. With the, mm -hmm. ah, Okay, so you can understand why I'm so excited. Then it's uh, I'm really I'm, I'm blown away by uh, what what okay, this give, give little the, camera can give do. Give me the 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 feature benefit paragraph of what this is, because I, I feel like I've been in a cave. You both have, are familiar with it, and I have no idea what this is. 
Well, you know, you look at this camera, and I have the DP2, and, it, you know, it's, it's compact with a, basically an APS-C sensor, in it, but it's a foveon, so it has the layers. Yep. And it's like the most plain, dull camera that you've ever seen. I mean, you're just looking at it, you go, really? And uh, But once I learned a little bit about it, they've matched the lens and the sensor and the software in this this crazy marriage of of uh, image processing and it's slow and it's kind of methodical and you end up with um, with uh, processing uh, and images that I think are just they amaze me and you know you just zoom in zoom in zoom in and the amount of detail and the tonal uh, rendition of it it's crazy so mm -hmm. I yeah and um, I'm just started doing some black and white prints from uh, you know Lindsay I when I output it, I, I double them up and output them and doing some big black and white prints from it. And it's, uh, I'm having a blast. And so, so who, who's this camera for? I mean, is it, I mean, is it, is it for the, the commercial portrait shooter? Is it landscape? Uh, that's so that's hard. That's a really good question. Cause that's I a really good question to answer it, Lindsay. <laughs> it's what I do. Come on. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's a question that everybody probably struggle with, struggles with because it is, Massive file sizes. Yes. I mean, I've I've seen this printed. I mean this sincerely. I've seen this printed to a four foot by six foot print, where I see. I mean, it's in, insane detail. You're standing there, and I thought it was shot with like a medium format digital back, exactly. wow. and it's it's literally a point and shoot. So who it appeals to? I mean, I almost think it just appeals to to gear nerds like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking because I'm about to. I'm gonna go buy it after this. <laughs> I mean, because it's um, it's not. It definitely is not fast. It is not something that you would be shooting a lot of frames with. It's not something that gives you a lot of versatility in anything besides the basic essential camera settings. But the file quality is what's crazy. So I, I would put it that way. If if you really want this detail, you want this tonal range, you want huge prints and you want it to come from a tiny little point and shoot, then that fits you. Other than that, it doesn't really fit a specific type of person, but what I've seen the best quality images from is actually probably different than him. Um, I saw some studio quality, quality images. It has a hot shoe, so you can hook up um, you know, your pocket wizard or whatever you have, yeah. and um, that's what I saw, some incredible detail. It's pretty cool. Uh -huh. So this, so this camera, and, and I'll, I'll move on from this in a second, so this camera is not designed to replace your mirrorless or your DSLR pro-ish no, camera. No, it doesn't really... No, because it doesn't really have that, that functionality exactly. It does not have interchangeable lenses. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to be able to shoot high frames per second. It's not something that you would be... Um, I mean, it's, it's definitely portable. So I think it's almost like a, an in-between of the two. Um, it's interesting. I know that this particular camera and technology from insider sources is, is going somewhere in a different mm -hmm. direction. So I actually have no idea what it is. So I wonder if they'll take it even further, maybe towards those kind of mirrorless camera idea, yeah. um, so that it appeals to that audience more. Because that makes sense to me. Kind of more yeah. the mirrorless camera idea for the studio, the high quality. But I, I'll be surprised as you guys. But Lizzie, well, you could you could say that about most cameras that, yeah, they're gonna go in a different direction. They're gonna evolve. <laughs> so I wonder, yeah. I wonder where this thing is going. And Derek, so you you're testing it right now. Is this? I am. The, the litmus test is, is: Are you gonna buy this camera? Is it a camera that you need to have in your arsenal? Well, it depends on how quickly Sigma asks for it back. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, I'm not ready to give it up yet. But. I, you know, I did get some training on it. You know, Jack Howard took some time out and you know, kind of helped me understand how to how to use it. And you know, to answer your question that you asked, Lindsay, I think it replaces my Hasselblad 500C with uh with the 80 millimeter lens. I mean, that's kind of the 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 rig, except in in this in a smaller package. Seriously? Okay. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, well, I, I feel the, the, a review coming up on that. Well, we, the more to come. I, I've got a lot more work to do on it. But I'm, I'm as you can tell, I'm pretty excited about because it, it just surprised the heck out of me. I can definitely. I'm actually yeah. I'm shooting something with it in about a week, so I'll send you the files. Maybe it'll be useful. For yes. You. Yes. Please. I want, send please me one do. too. I want to. I want to pixel peep at that too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You have pixel to download the uh, the Sigma software. Yeah. You know, I, can, I can do yeah. that. Yeah. All right, guys, before we move on, uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. A heads up that the latest episode of All About the Gear is live on thisweekinphoto.com. Doug K. 
dove into the Fujifilm XE1 and kind of pull back the covers on that. And it's, uh, I guess, the, the to spoil it, the Reader's Digest version is wait for the XE2. But check out, check out, <laughs> check out the review. <laughs> you definitely spoiled it. <laughs> I spoiled it. There's another number after one, apparently. <laughs> so, so definitely check that out. It was a really good conversation. Also, yesterday, um, I did a hangout with Trey Radcliffe and crew on Trey's new project. It's called The Arcanum. It's a school for creatives based on that whole master apprentice model. And uh, Trey and uh, Peter Giordano and uh, Bill Jones and I sat down in a hangout to talk through what the thing is, what it's for, what problems they're solving and all that. So check definitely check that out. It should be, uh, it'll be live. I'm going to do some editing on it and post it hopefully live tomorrow-ish. But definitely, uh, definitely give that a look when it comes out. It'll be live on thisweekinphoto.com. And also, um, I want to give a quick thank you to our sponsor. And this week's show is sponsored by our friends over at Shutterstock.com. All right, folks, let's jump into the show. The first story, and actually the main bulk of this episode, is about portraiture. And I know both of you guys know a little bit about that particular art form. So, first of all, I want to set the stage. Lindsay, I want to throw it to you first. Looking at your work, it's just, in, in from our earlier conversation on just your work and how you do things, you've got it down to a science, but a science around the art of photography and generating the ideas and bringing the assistance in to help you build everything and realize your vision. Where would you say portraiture, like in your in your evolution as a photographer back from when you started as a kid till now, where how would you say things have changed the most in your opinion? Um, for me personally, when I started doing portrait photography, I was taking pictures of what people looked like. I mean that's really where it started. And what I found out is, for me, I, was, I had a portrait studio in upstate New York, and I was photographing people for engagement sessions and, and weddings and, and newborn sessions and families and all of that. And so while it started with photographing what people looked like, I found that people loved the images that much more when the image was about who they are. Mm -hmm. So if I could incorporate something imp important to them, whether it's a family member or a prop or some kind of storytelling element, they... I mean, those are the ones that brought people to tears, not just the ones of here's what, you know, I mean, sometimes people would get emotional of this is what my child looks like, but something that just expressed who they were touched their hearts even more. And, um, you know, it's I've since changed a bit in my work. So right now I'm a fashion photographer in New York, but I, you know, a lot of my paid work is definitely, uh, fa it's portraits with a fashion twist to it. So my clients get to get to be the model you know they get to be that you know the model in the magazine but it doesn't they don't have to look like a model they don't have to be the size of a traditional model um, so my work now sometimes the portrait work is even less about the person and more the role they get to play in a fantastical scene so yeah. um, it depends on what the client wants but it's a little bit of everything yeah, see, that that's what I wanted to get to. That's that's perfectly put, because I, I look at portraiture as kind of, I don't know, and this is my opinion, I want to bat it between you guys, as almost an outdated word, because I hear, like, from modern photographers that are cutting edge like you guys, that are doing this really, you know, innovative, artistic work, and I see your work, and it's it's fashion, it's high-end, it's edgy, it's like, you know, it makes people look twice at it. It's that kind of work. When I think portraiture, I think... You know, sit in the sit in the chair, three quarter pose. You know, three point lighting. You know, that Rembrandt, that kind of thing. You guys don't have any rules in the stuff you do, Derek. What do you, what do you think about that? Is it is the word portraiture is outdated, or is it has it just evolved into something else? Well, I mean, we might be bringing that baggage with us, right? Because yeah. you know, you know, we we came up through that, and and you know, maybe someone coming into it today wouldn't look at it at all that way. Yeah. But uh, you know, I I agree with you. I think it's good to know that still. I do. I really think it's good to know the lighting schemes, a little bit about posing, mm -hmm. uh, just like any other craft. It's it's sort of good to know the basics. Once you, you got, do, you though, know the rules. You got to know the rules so that you can break the rules, right? Well, y yeah, you know, but you know, once you know that, uh, then I think that's when the fun begins. Because I mean, I, I had to do staff work for years where it was exactly what you were describing, and it was horrible. I felt like I was in a factory. 
I, I, <laughs> seriously, I did. It was like a factory job, you know. And uh, you know, I couldn't wait to 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 break away from that. And uh, you know, now I I don't follow most of those rules at all. And I, I'm shooting with uh, with cameras that have you know high ISO capability, and I'm I'm letting things go really dark on the shadow side, and mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's just it's a lot more fun. But I think Lindsay said it, and you know, one of my photographers, favorite photographers, is Avedon, who also I thought you know what he tried to do and what Lindsay's talking about where you just sort of bring out something about the person into the shot and, and then that is an expression of them and it, you don't really need all the three-point lighting and the stool and everything to do that in fact all of that probably totally works against that yeah and then like Derek on your side I know you're you're moving more in the mirrorless direction and Lindsay you're kind of in the opposite direction and there's no right answer for this stuff how has how has like gear choices changed for you guys specifically Derek like you mentioned with the high ISOs there right so right. your lighting has changed no longer do you need the giant power pack and sun pack you know mm. you don't need to recreate the surface of the sun in order to get a good shot these days Lizzie you want, you want to take that how does how has the advances in the efficiencies of our gear changed your overall equipment makeup it's, you know, I, I've been shooting for a while, though I'm mm -hmm. young, um, and I, I like that I learned all the rules because at this point, since I know that I can do any of the traditional photography, I've done it, I have the capabilities, mm -hmm. I don't feel the need to validate or justify myself when I do something creative, when I do something that breaks the rules, when I shoot an extremely high ISO. Um, so some of my portrait work, for example, might be shot more like, the, there's a fashion photographer, Sarah Moon, which her pictures looked like, um, I mean, they looked like almost old paintings. A lot of them were blurry. A lot of them were grainy. And, and I don't feel the need to say, oh, look at this photo. Okay, we, it was really on purpose. No, you can tell that right. it was on purpose. <laughs> right. you know, that's, that's, if, so my opinion in fashion photography is if it looks like you did it on purpose, you're golden. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's really the most important part. So for me, um, the gear is, is really secondary to the idea. I figure out what my concept is, and then I pick the right piece of gear. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean that I'm not sometimes gear geeks like you guys and, and pick the best piece of gear. Hey, that's Derek. I, Derek is the gear geek. I'm <laughs> just, uh, you know. <laughs> no, but like, there definitely is the right tool for the job. Um, and so it's, it's more or less knowing those tools. Um, and I've, I, I'm as guilty as the rest for having a lot of the tools available to me. But yeah, I've definitely, I've actually shot, um, I've shot a couple beautiful sessions at 3200 ISO. Yeah. I, now, Lindsay, yeah. when you when you go through that, so just to, you you touched on it a little bit your your process of like sort of the reverse of some people accumulate a room full of gear and then try to hypothesize what kind of shot they could do with all this gear that they have. Pay no attention to the gear on the shelf behind me, by the way. But some, <laughs> some, people, some people accumulate all this gear and then they figure out what shot they can do. And from our interview, you're the reverse, right? So you, you do it the right way, in my opinion, where you like, okay, what's something cool? I have an idea. I want to do this shot. You sketch it out. And then you figure out what pieces you need to accomplish that mission. Is that fair? Is that what you do? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's the exact same type of knowledge. I still know about all the gear. I just don't let it dominate what I do. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't mean this to be critical, but a lot of times when I see people's work, I can tell those photographers whose gear dominates mm -hmm. and whose the lighting setups that they've learned dominate because they learned something that was really complicated or something they were told was the best. And so they force the portrait into that. And I'll see three-point traditional lighting set up when that subject did not warrant that type of lighting. It doesn't even make sense. So, so what they started with, okay, I know this lighting. Well, that works for this subject. So yeah, I, I definitely do it the other way around, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, both of you take this. How, how, do you, how do you determine a style in this stuff? Both of you have distinctive styles. How do you determine what your style is over time? Because you know, I, I know that the easy answer is keep shooting and the style will emerge over time. Or you're influenced by people who you know you whose work you admire. But what's what's another way to just sort of get your brain around? Okay, I I lean towards sort of desaturated, blurry shots, and that's my look. <laughs> Derek, you want to take that? How do you, how do you get into that? How do you figure that out? You know, it's, it's a it's an odd question in in the sense that <clears throat> yeah, a lot of times I'll start out a portrait session and I'll start out with what I think is going to work. And, uh, you know, I think the style emerges when I see something 
that I like. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, the first one or two things I try don't work. It's it's really it's kind of uh, inside it's, it's unnerving on the outside. I you know I say oh no I'm just kind of working a few things here you know just yeah. relax. <laughs> yeah. But um, but uh, it's funny to me how often I guess wrong at the start of the portrait session. You know in terms of how to light or how to do something. The minute I see the image of the person that feels right that resonates, then that's the direction that I go. So I'm not really thinking style. I'm thinking what feels right. And so you're, uh, yeah, you. You're like you keying in to what the person looks like and their personality, and then following that vein. Sort of following it, and you, you know, it's still funny after all these years. How often on my first guess, I'll, I'll guess wrong on, on mm -hmm. how to on how to pull that out. But uh, and then it's funny to your point. Then when I do find it, and and then if I look at let's say ten different uh, sessions, and uh, there will be a theme that runs through it. So. You, um, I think the style sort of comes out of maybe keep probing, uh, you know. Yeah. But you've got to use some sort of inner voice or something that feels right. You, I think Lindsay made a good point. Just don't try to force your stuff on 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 the subject. It, it, you're not gonna you're not gonna develop a style that way for sure unless your style is mechanical. Yeah. Right. Now, Lindsay, what about you? Because I know a lot of a lot of beginning photographers and amateurs and advanced amateurs, they look at you guys, they look at magazines, they look they look in all these places, and they say, "Yeah, I like that. I'm going to take that and I'm going to go redo it with my kid or my girlfriend or whatever." And that's the way they learn from emulating and then branching off from there. Is that the right way to go, or should they be sketching out in a blank on a blank page and and coming up with their own ideas? What's a, what's a good way to guide folks? Yeah, um, I you know what, that's actually the way I do most of the things, most of the concept development I have. So there's a, there's a famous saying that says, if you copy from one author, it's plagiarism. If you copy from many, it's research. And, yes. you know, that's, that's kind of how Better I feel about down. it. <laughs> right? It's great. Yeah. Um, that's how I feel about it. So when I'm looking for inspiration for a shoot, you know, the, the first thing that I'm looking for is is what am I trying to say? What am I trying to emphasize in the shoot? Is it about what the person looks like? About an emotion? About a feeling? And I go and do research, and I have a long list of favorite photographers that I regularly look at, and I have my Pinterest boards, and and that's exactly what it is. Is I just don't pick one image to emulate. I pick many, um, many different things. I pick the lighting from one photographer. I pick the hair and makeup from another, and so I create something that we call in fashion photography a mood board. Mm -hmm. And a, a mood board is going to be a collection of images that express the overall feeling of a shoot. So it will be the hair, the makeup, the location, the lighting, the feeling. And so I, I piece it together there. And you know, as far as what he was talking about, about not getting it right at first, um, that's absolutely true. You have to be adaptable. I think a lot of people get really worked up when they think that they've done so much preparation. They think they have that solution <laughs> and then it's not working and you stick yeah. to it. And um, so what I do is I do figure out what I want to say because if it's if it's dark and dramatic, I know I need you know maybe a more contrasty modifier or the light needs to go to the side more to create more shadow. But beyond that, you know, when I'm looking at the image, I'm just saying, hey, is it reaching that final goal? Um, and I definitely draw inspiration from a lot of other photographers. Just careful not to copy. I love that. I love that. See that, and that's that's the key, the key piece there, and that's the line that a lot of people get mixed up on. Is like, okay, be careful not to copy, but be inspired by. You know, this work was inspired by Lindsay Adler, but it's not a direct copy of her particular shot, right? And and I think it's fine if there are a lot of similarities. It's it's when it gets to the point where you're trying to get the pose to match exactly, the lighting to match exactly, the makeup to match exactly. Um, and I think if you just want to be safe. You know, pick an element of the photo that you like. Pick an mm -hmm. element from each different photo and integrate those together. And then you don't even have mm -hmm. to worry about it, um, you know, if that is something you're concerned about. But I'll put it this way. Um, if you are, aren't feeling like you're copying, you're probably okay. If you're getting a little nervous, then just add something of yourself into it. And not uh, about style. Just for me personally, uh, a tip that I would give people trying to find style is I only found mine, you know, maybe in the last three years, four years, what my true style, um, because I love to shoot everything. I love to shoot everything. I love to try different things. I don't want to you know, hold myself to one particular style. Um, but what I did is I began analyzing my favorite photos that I've taken, my favorite photos that other photographers have taken, 
and I was really seeking out what they have in common. Like I actually just analyzed the photos that if some I would die if someone made me take out of my portfolio. Mm -hmm. What's what's in common about those? And what I found is they were all clean, bold, and graphic. You know, they had a bright color or a really graphic pose, something that just grabbed your eye. I don't have, you know, a lot of complex environments. If I do, it's because they're they're graphic, and so I looked at my favorite images, and I could see that. And so when I would plan a shoot, I would just say, I, I might try a few things and I'd say, all right, where's my clean, bold, and graphic image? Let me make that for this shoot. And so, um, and I gave myself a lot of assignments too. So that would be my suggestion: analyze your work that you love of your own, the stuff you love of other people, and where where do they cross? Yeah, and it sounds like less is less is more, and it it, it rings true here. Derek, do you do the do you do the, the thing that Lindsay was talking about with a vision or inspiration board before your shoots, you know, where you bring bring things together and sort of be inspired? I actually think about it while I'm doing laundry is uh, what I do. <laughs> <laughs> you're inspired when you're doing your socks. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, no, I mean, it's, it is. I mean, it, it's so weird when you work for yourself because, uh, you, you know, one of the things you have to fight is, like, I, I have to be productive every moment. But mm -hmm. a lot of times on this sort of stuff, you just you, you have to bounce around and so you're doing a lot of odd things while you're percolating or at least so I do yeah. while I'm percolating on it and so I'm, I'm doing laundry and I'm you know uh, doing something really boring and all that kind of stuff thinking about the shot so that when I'm ready to go uh, then I, I, I have a place to start mm -hmm. and uh, I don't sketch it up but I definitely think about it for a while first and uh, I think that's very important I think it's very. You have to have a starting place, and you know when you work with a a, a model or someone who's uh, used to being in front of the camera, they're expecting you to have your shit, your stuff together. Uh, you know when you start the shoot. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, you know, they, at least the ones I work with, they don't want a photographer who goes, well, so hey, what do you want to do today? You know, no, mm -hmm. they, that's, that's, that's they're not. They're instill confidence. Right. Yeah, it what does not. do you think I should use? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's your best side? No, you know, uh, so, I mean, they, my feeling is that the subject wants you to take charge, wants you to inspire confidence, and, you know, and wants you to make them feel confident, no matter what your, no matter what type of portrait, that they want to feel confident in front of the camera. We'll continue and, uh, that thought, Derek, because I, want, I wanted to segue that into rapport building and the actual session itself. You know, so yeah. when you 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 got everything, Lindsay, you got your your vision board. You know where you're going with this. You're inspired. You got your gear out there. You're ready to go. And then the client shows up on set or wherever you're going to be shooting this person. How do you how do you put them at ease? How do you put them in a place where <laughs> you know hey, I'm not worried and I I think. I, I feel that you're a competent photographer and you're going to do a good job on me. I don't have to worry about you making me look bad. Lindsay, you want to you take that? Sure. So I can give you an example of a type of a shoot that I do a lot. Um, okay. I'm asked to, to photograph a lot of professional athletes. And a lot of time they're women. So what I'm actually given is I'm given tasks that uh, what I need to express visually for these people. So for these women, I need to express um, one image about their athleticism another one about their femininity, another one about their professionalism. So we'll have the different goals that I have to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I will do, of course, is if it's somebody that's more of a celebrity, I will, of course, do my research. Um, and I'll just have an idea a little bit about them, their past. And um, there's always some common threads um, of things that you, that you relate to. And typically, for me, because on my shoots, people are getting their hair and makeup done, um, I'll just sit down real casually and have a chat with them. And it'll be about places they've been. And if I can find an overlap with there, we'll talk about that. Like Anything to show that I'm a person, you're a person, we have similarities. Um, and yeah. if I can find somebody's passion, then I'm in. If, and so that's what I do. I say, so you know, what, do you, what do you love to do for fun? What are your passions? Because if you even just listen to the person and just feel that passion pouring out of them, when I'm on set, when I'm actually photographing them, I use knowledge of their passions to pull emotions. And there's actually a famous, you know, Avedon story. He was photographing um, these, this, the Duke. I think it was the Duke and Duchess of York or something like that. And um, they were, I believe, they were kind of fascist. They were bad people. And he found out that they loved dogs, loved dogs. And he got asked to shoot them, and he didn't want to because he, you know, he thought that they were bad people, and he wasn't interested. So he's has a portrait session 
you know, all set up and he has his camera ready and he, he says something to the effect, he puts his hand on his head and he looks really upset. And, you know, they, they say, well, what's wrong? He's like, actually, on, on the way to, to the shoot today, I saw somebody run over a dog. And they make these horrible expressions and he takes a ton of pictures and he sends these awful looking photos to everyone. Um, because he was trying to express basically the inner ugliness that he oh, saw in these people. Yeah. Um, and so this is one of his most famous portraits. Um, mm -hmm. Now, let's put it this way. You don't, want, you don't want to make your clients look ugly, and you don't want to show this inner ugliness, but I actually use it the opposite way. I find out what they love because I can, I can talk about something they love or ask them to tell me a story, and you see it glow in their eyes, and that's how I'm able to get a lot of that expression. I get them thinking about those things. So... Um, so I will definitely do that to build rapport um, and then whenever I have an image that I love of the person I just show my you know elation at this beautiful image and I show them I'm like oh my god you look amazing look how great you look and I'm showing the back of the camera um, I am not at all hesitant to do that because my excitement transfers over to them and I'm not afraid of them not liking something if they want to tweak something that's fine but usually if they see you're excited they just agree with you and then the whole shoot has a positive atmosphere yeah yeah, see, that's good. See, I mean, it's, so you're bringing down the walls before you actually get into the shoot proper, which is which is amazing. Derek, do you do the, do you do the same thing? Yeah, I I mean, I think the the second point Lindsay made is is the important one for me, which is as quickly as possible show them a good shot, show mm -hmm. them a good shot in the back of the camera. That seems to build confidence so quickly, and it's also an argument I think because I have people ask me all the time, well, you know, why do you worry about color balance so much if it's a color shoot or all that sort of stuff because you know you can just fix it in post well of course you can thing is though when you're on set and you want to build confidence with the client if you show them something on the back of the camera that's spot on that shows them in a flattering light and the color is good and everything then they're gonna have confidence in you and I think the, the shoot just you know zooms forward from there if you're saying well you know I'm gonna fix the color later on in post it doesn't have the same effect. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Now, what, so speaking of post, what about post? Now, Derek, are you? Are you? <laughs> I have a feeling, Derek, you're doing your own post, and Lindsay, I have a feeling you're sending your post out. Is that? Am I on right there? Uh, it depends, actually. Oh, um, okay. If you if you would have asked me at the beginning of this year, January first of last year, um, I was still doing almost all of my post um, mm -hmm. because I was being a control freak, right? Um, and Guilty. I believe, I feel, I, feel, I feel that I'm a very good retoucher and I know that I want what I want from that. But um, I actually spent this year kind of uh, building relationships with retouchers that understood what I want out of a portrait. So I'll put it this way. Um, for anything that is blemish removal and basic, you know, skin improvements, I now outsource because there's, more important things I should be spending my time doing, like marketing and client relationships. Yes. Um, but anytime it is a creative effect, I'm absolutely still doing it, um, and because it, and it, it needs my it needs my touch, it needs my vision. For me, my creativity doesn't stop when I click the camera and the client leaves. I mean, it definitely continues into post. So, you know, if it's anything creative, that's that's still on me. Yeah. See that 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 is a really good topic that I want to talk about because that that. I know a lot of photographers that do that. Like they'll do what you just said, Lindsay. They'll click, hand it off, and someone else handles their vision. Someone else knows what they look, like, you know, what their look is, and they can recreate it. It's the extension of them. And then other photographers like you, Lindsay, and I gravitate more towards what you're doing. I like to, you know, I want to. It's my baby. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to send. I don't want to send it out. Derek, what, you you're doing your post yourself, or are you sending it out on occasion? What do you do? Uh, I, I have the luxury of being able to do it myself, and yeah. you know that, and that's because of the the quantity, you know, and yeah. so I, I'm able to do it. And uh, I I kind of have to do it myself because part of my process it depends on how important the portrait and the client is, of course. Sure. But part of my process is to make a print when I at the the first point of where I think I have something. And then let the print lay around for a day or so and live with it, um, and then uh, go back to it and maybe finish it off. And and so I, I I kind of I'm able to do that. I'm lucky because you know the shooting is you know is just one of my revenue streams, yeah. and so I, I don't have to hand it off. But um, you know if I had to, I would. I'm I'm glad I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, it's it's 
It's interesting. It's interesting to listen to the, the different methodologies that go on in different photographers' minds about the pixels that they create and who they allow to touch those pixels. <laughs> touch those pixels. And, uh, I think it does have to do with uh, volume and then the type of business you're running. Because uh, honestly, I um, you know, there's a lot of things now that I'll send out and I'll have the basic skin retouching done. Not because I can't do it myself, but I have people that can do it. And then I'll do the creative stuff next because I have a lot of things that I should probably be doing with my time. So um, right. I think I think that the photographer grows when they learn to let go of the things they should yep. and never let go of the things they shouldn't. That's so. the secret The secret of the ultra-rich. They say do more of what you're good at and yep. farm the stuff up that you're not so good at and the stuff that you hate off to other people and just like, repeat that cycle. <laughs> Keep doing like more and more of the stuff you love doing. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about delivery? You know, both of you guys. So, like, clearly two different kinds of photographers. Lindsay, when you're when you finish one of your pieces, I know it varies depending on who the client is. But where where generally does it go? You're not printing yourself. Does it go out to a lab to get printed, or is it just you know you're delivering tips to a to a magazine? What's the final output for you generally? So if it's for a magazine, um, all I'm doing is delivering tips. Although they're a client, they, they don't, honestly, they don't even want anything physical because um, it's just clutter and they have such a high turnover that's not even something that they're interested in. Yeah. Um, but if it is for a client that's spending a lot of money, I, I definitely want um, a higher quality product, something that they can hold in their hands and understand what they spent all that money on. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it will be a print. They didn't pay for it. It's just something that I, I give them. But actually, I have something here that's uh, a good example. Um, so I've got this. This is from Miller's. Okay, and this was a, a boudoir session that I did. Oh, look at that. And it's a wood wooden box. And then in it, um, I have a, a custom, you know, custom USB. Oh, and nice. so that'll be something I deliver because, honestly, uh, people don't have CD... Um, you know, we places to use CDs anymore. I, my laptop, there's no place to put a CD. So USB yep. is definitely the way to go. So when a client, um, when I'm done with a shoot, they definitely get the files delivered to them digitally. But I try to include basically this box with a print in it or a larger print with the USB just so it, it feels nicer to them, something tangible. Yeah. Isn't that no, interesting? Can... Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way. Someone sent me a CD the other day and... I could not, I mean, in fact, I had to buy, because I wanted to see what was on the CD, I had to order a USB CD-ROM drive from Amazon <laughs> so that I could plug it into my Mac so I could read this outdated yeah. optical media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Derek, what about you? Output. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, you mentioned printing. Is that, uh, is that the only... It's not output? usually the deliverable. I, I'm usually doing kind of what Lindsay says, which is the they're not expecting a print. I, I give them a print and uh, because it just feels good. And then a uh, USB drive or uh, d some jobs they just download right off, you know, uh, right off the site. You know, so yeah. I'll, I'll set up a, a, a private uh, thing for them and, and they can uh, go through them and download what they want. And you know, I just let them have at it. You know, yeah. everything on there is for them. Now, now speaking of like, what about self assignments for you guys, portraiture wise? One of the things that we had in the notes here was we were going to talk about selfie photography. For, <laughs> yeah, so the the those are two different things. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Yeah, I know. That's what I was talking about. So the, the differences between the two. So you're like people. This word selfie, which I don't even agree with, and I know Sony actually has a mode on one of their cameras called the selfie mode. <laughs> no way! I didn't know that. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually this camera right here. This is the NEX 5R, and when you take oh, wow. the LCD and flip it up like this, it's yeah. in selfie mode. <gasps> oh it, my flips gosh. The, it flips the image, <laughs> and when you hit the button, it does a countdown timer here so you can see when it's going to take the picture. Wow. So selfie is here to stay. So when you guys are like doing your self projects, do you, and I know a lot of photographers do this. You do this, you know, multiplicity or whatever. Generally pretty women, I've noticed. I don't see a whole lot of dudes... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I just noticed this. So, are you guys doing that at all? Are you doing any like self-portraiture type things as far as your self-assignments? Lindsay, you go first. Um, so, for me personally, I don't do any self-portrait work. It's I, it's funny. I don't want to say it like this, but I've never inspired myself. It was it's, you know, it doesn't mean like that. But um, yeah, one of my one of my very very best friends. Um, her name's Brooke Shaden, and she. 
you know, a majority, not all of it, but a majority of her fine art work has been self-portraiture. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely feel that that is far removed from what the term selfie brings to my mind. It's um, different, right? Yes. Yeah, a selfie is like... <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think selfie is is more in my mind capturing what you look like and how you feel at a moment. For me, I think it's about the moment mm -hmm. um, versus a self portrait is much more about an expression or an emotion or something about you more profound as an individual. So I kind of separate those two. And and my personal work, um, I my personal work is still fashion or fine art or. Um, anything like that, and I have to do a self plug. It's not a huge one, but my um, the book that just came out, which I have here. Yeah, let me see that. Okay, see this that. one. Okay, it is. Creative fifty two. Look at that. It is a self assignment book. That's what it is. It's mm -hmm. um, fifty two weekly assignments, and it's separated into to concept, um, technique, and post processing. So I give myself assignments all the time. Um, to grow, and so I was saying for um, developing my style, I look at other people's work, you know, that I really admire, and I pick that element, and I give my, myself an assignment to incorporate that element into my work. So, um, absolutely, it's just not not self portrait work. I love that. So, what is it called again? Creative Fifty Two. Creative Fifty Two. Yep, just came Hold out. Hold that up again. I want to see that again. I want to see the cover. <laughs> that is. Well, let me make sure it's on the screen there. Yeah, that is beautiful. Look at that. Thank you. And that's on where it's available in fine retailers everywhere right now. Yep. Um, you can get it in Barnes and Noble, Amazon, my website. So awesome. I'm okay. just I'm very proud of it, and uh, I think self assignments. If if you're a photographer and you get stuck shooting just the work that pays because you want to be a professional, professional means pay usually. Um, what ends up happening is the work that pays you is not always the work that fulfills you. In fact, it can actually pull you the opposite direction of where you want to go because it's paying the bills and that's what it means to be professional, right? Well, yeah. um, I mean, one of the things I can recommend to a photographer to improve not just their, their business but their life in general is to shoot things that reward them because that's what moves your, your career, your portfolio, everything in your life in the right direction is shooting yeah. the things that make you love photography even more. Yeah, that's what feeds your sort of photographic energy is to shoot the things that inspire you. Yeah, and you're right. It it pulls you in the opposite direction. And when you and that's the weird catch twenty two, because you're getting paid but you're not shooting something that you want to shoot. So, you know, it, it fills up your fills up your, your bank account on the monetary side, but then it's a deficit on the creative side. So it's yeah. a, it's always a balance. Derek, what about you? I know you're a big selfie dude. You're always taking <laughs> selfies, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I do a lot of uh, self assignment because I write so much, and yeah. uh, I you know I don't want to publish other people's photos with my writing. So I'm my own stock agency. So I love it because uh, the bulk of the shooting I do is just for me, just my ideas, just things that I want to do, and uh, I'm lucky that way. But you know, one thing I want to mention about you know. Um, professional uh, in the you know professional can mean a lot of different things and you know one of the things about these days is that you don't have to be a photographer a hundred percent of the time and you know we all know that you know you can't be anyway you're, you're running a business and you have to do all these other things sure. but but you can combine photography with a lot of stuff that really can take you to some interesting places and for me it's been writing and photography together and the writing a lot of times will lead me to some really interesting you know shooting and so you know I, I think that you coming up with the ideas of what you're going to photograph is a far more interesting way to uh, make your living than, you know, I, I hate people looking over my shoulder while I'm shooting, actually. In fact, I, I really can't stand it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it, that's the way to go. It's, I mean, it's, it's a great way to go depending on your personality. So before we leave this topic, any, any Derek, from you, since you're already on it, any parting tips, tricks that you want to give folks on, you know, how to to sort of stay inspired on photography um, or portraiture and that sort of thing? Yeah, do uh, shoot what you love, do what you love. And uh, it's just so much easier because, you know, to be good at anything, whether it's writing or photography or, or you know, any, any craft, uh, it's so hard. It's so hard. And, you know, I think 
being passionate and loving it and being excited every day is really the only thing that that you know keeps you going forward so yeah. don't don't take on stuff you don't want to do I mean if, if you don't want to do product shots don't take on the assignment yeah. you know just because you get a paycheck it will erode away at you but yeah and it's a you know the paycheck thing it's a fine line right because yeah it's like you know I don't want to I don't want to compromise my photog photographic integrity by taking things that I don't want to do but then there's these screaming kids over there that need formula, so I don't. <laughs> I don't know. You got to well, balance it, right? Well, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I, I mean, I, I've never been what I call rich, and I, I doubt that I never will be. But you know what? I here I am at this point in my life, and I'm still working for myself, and I'm doing what I love, and I'm going to do it for as long as I want to do it. And I, I really can't put a, a, a price tag on that. So, yeah. you know, I, I just, I think the advice is always do what you love. If you're passionate about, if you love baseball, then, you know, then you should be shooting baseball, you know, and don't try to make yourself a wedding photographer. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's right. a yeah. paycheck there. Yeah. You yeah. Know, you stay at it long enough, you will make money. Yeah, and it you know that's the, that's the thing that is really good advice because the lure, you know, it, as photographers, especially when you're new and you're coming into this, the lure is the shiny object, right? And it's like, hey, I just heard yeah. so and so photographer said that they're making X thousand dollars a yeah. year by shooting yeah. weddings. I should shoot weddings. <laughs> exactly, know? exactly. You know, and you, know, you can fall into that trap. You can yeah. fall into that trap. You know. Yep, and then you're a wedding photographer, and you're like, "How did I get here? I don't really like oh, weddings." Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I you know I did I did weddings for a while because I I did need the money, but I didn't do only weddings, and I had a plan that I was and and I don't want to knock wedding photography sure, because it, it was very good to me when I did it, but um but I had a plan that I you know that I was going to keep doing the other stuff, and as the other stuff became uh, more viable than I would pair back and yeah. you know and, and that's the way I do all the revenue streams every, every time I'm always shooting for something that I really want to do and the minute I land it then I get rid of the stream that I like the least and if yeah. you keep doing that you just keep moving forward then you you find that each week you're doing more of what you love and less of what you don't yeah yeah Love it. Hey, it looks like uh, something happened on Lindsay's side, yeah. and she got booted out of the Hangout. Hopefully, she'll be able to rejoin us, but we'll we'll press Come on. Back. Come and, back, Lindsay. Okay, we'll keep our fingers crossed that <laughs> yes. Lindsay will be able to rejoin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but let's move. Let's move right along. Jesus, time is just flying. See, when I get started talking about portraiture and that kind of stuff, the yeah. time just just yeah. flies by. Um, before we uh, continue into the picks of the week, let's uh, give a nod to our other sponsor this week in, this week of this week in photo, and that would be Squarespace. All right, it is time for our listener Q and A. This is the segment where we answer some of the questions that have been bubbling at the top of our listeners' minds. First question, or the only question that we're going to hit on this week, is from Gordon Burns, and this came to us from the TWIP community page on Google+. He says. I'm looking for online content proofing services for my portrait photography work. Do you have any suggestions for me? Derek, what do you think? Online proofing. Yeah, for online client proofing. Yeah. We need we need Lindsay for this. I know. Like, yeah, this is this is this is Lin this got Lindsay written all over it. I know. Uh, I don't have any suggestions cuz I don't I don't use uh, those services at all. Well, what do you use for like if if you do a job for like a model or something like that, and you want to show her the you know the the shots? Yeah, I I put a, a private gallery up on Smug Mug, okay. uh, send send uh, her or him uh, the link. Uh, I make sure the file numbers are showing, and I only put up shots that I think are you know that they should be looking at. I don't put everything up, and uh, and that's the way they can review them. And so, That's a key piece right there that you glossed over a little bit. You don't <laughs> put everything up there no, that no, you no. got and let them choose. You put your favorites up there. The, you know, the, and I tell you, there's a real art to that part of it. And uh, because one of the, when we we're talking earlier about showing the subject, some of the shots during the shoot, I'm also looking at what they're responding to because uh, part of this art of putting up. You know, a good uh, collection of images is not only stuff that you think is good, but also s stuff that will resonate with them. And I see this in workshops, and I see this in my own work all the time. A lot of times, what the photographer really likes and what the subject really likes 
uh, aren't always exactly the same. Yeah. So on one hand, you only want to put up quality work. On the other hand, you want to stretch a little bit, and especially if you have any feedback from the subject, so you get stuff up that may resonate with them that, that might not be your favorite stuff. Yeah. And uh, you, it always, I think, really listen when a, when a subject uh, gives you feedback about which shots that they like, because I think it helps you kind of perfect that system of putting up a good collection. Yeah, so it's, again, keeping in mental contact and keeping that sort of flow of information back and forth between you and the client or the subject, and oh. it stretches from the portrait session or the photography session all the way through to when you're picking the selects. You can say, oh, I know this person will probably like this kind of shot because they were gravitating yes. towards it. Yes, yes, yes exactly. Good. And uh, we see that in the workshops a lot where we have the models stay and... Uh, during the select period mm -hmm. and it, it's funny how often uh, the photographers in the workshop are surprised by the shots that the model likes versus the shots that they like. Yeah. Uh, it, it's fascinating actually. Love it, love it. All good advice. I'm taking notes, taking notes. All right, uh, let's move on. Hopefully fingers still crossed. Derek, you mentioned yesterday when we were at the game that your luck this week has been like <laughs> some reason the universe is after you, and I think it's in it, this hangout right now. Keep it. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. It's that's that's so brutal. But it has been a weird week for technology and, and cyber stuff. I I totally there agree. There are gremlins running amok. Yeah, I mean, somebody put water on the gremlins or something. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Derek, uh, let's jump into the Picks of the Week segment. Okay. Uh, listeners, remember this is our guests can pick anything as long as it is somehow related to photography. Derek, I'm going to let you go first. What is your Pick of the Week? Oh, hey. Lindsay's hey, we got Lindsay hey, back. Hey, hey. Woo! back. We, we had our fingers crossed waiting on you to get back in here. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for waiting. Hey, Derek. Hey, do you want to, uh, before I do that, do you want to run the, the question uh, by yeah, Lindsay? Yeah, Lindsay, Lindsay you, we, were think, listener Q &A, we were doing the listener Q&A oh. segment, and uh, Derek thought you might be ideally suited to answer this. Let me reread it for you. It's from uh, okay. listener Gordon Burns. He says, I'm looking for online client proofing services for my portrait photography work. Do you have any suggestions for me? What do you think, Lindsay? Um, okay, so... In the in the fashion world, a majority of us are using Photo Shelter mm -hmm. um, because the photo, shel photo Shelter is giving us the ability to control licensing, yeah. and so that makes much more sense there. Um, there. I mean, there's a ton of different services. I guess it depends on the capabilities that you really want to be able to offer your clients. For example, if you are looking for something to be seamless and beautiful, um, there's one called, oh my god, I just left my brain, hold on. Get it back in your brain. Hold on. Pixie Set. Yes. What's it Pixie called? Pixie Set. Good. Um, Pixie Set. P I X I E S E T. Okay. And what Pixie Set does is it creates uh, kind of a personalized um, HTML5 website for your client to proof. So let's say that you shoot a lot of weddings. Um, what it does is you can categorize the images and they'll like self populate and they can order and proof and favorite directly from there. And that has less to do with the capabilities and more to do with if that bride picked you because she loves the whimsical feel of your images, it's a beautiful way to show them um, yeah. versus if you want a little bit more flexibility. So um, I hate to be non-committal, but it really does depend on you know kind of what you're going for. Because personally, I think a lot of sites, you know, um, and it's not even to, to hate on Smug Mug or something like that, but it, it's you know, they give you a lot more flexibility in the client proofing and, and uh, capabilities like that, but it's not as pretty as something as Pixie Set. Um, but I do think that they're trying to get there. Okay, so branding. It's it's if you're leaning more towards personal branding of your your personal brand and making that weave all the way through from when you meet them all the way through to here's the proofs. Then, yeah, yeah P Pixie Set. No, you've used them before for some of your work. Yeah, just a, a couple things, and I just. I thought it was beautiful. I used them, however, um, for portrait sessions when they were selecting images, not prints. There is a print fulfillment, um, mm -hmm. but if you are selling a lot of prints, um, perhaps pick, picking something like a Smug Mug or a Zen Folio, folio that has um, print and product fulfillment integrated directly in it, maybe that's going to be better for you. So there's actually a ton of services out there. There's um, actually 
also many of them that allow you to do the client proofing and selections directly on your iPad. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's ones like Pad. Yeah. Yeah. Proof and I mean I there's actually like a dozen of them. Um, and so maybe that's going to be something that you prefer. So. Yeah, there's a yeah. You're right. I mean, there's there's no shortage of of choices out there, and it is a case by case basis because everyone's business is different, and everyone's client base is different. Lindsay, we were just jumping after that after the listener Q and A. We were jumping into the picks of the week. So this is a this is a segment of the show where you guys, the guests, can recommend something to the TWIP listeners as long as it is as long as it's somehow related to photography. Lindsay, do you have something to recommend, or should we let Derek go while you think something up? Can I can I do one and a half? You can do three if you want. This, this is your inaugural TWIP visit. Okay, you can do whatever okay. you want. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first one is, I don't want to say it's a brag session, but it's something that's really significant to me that I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. um, so today I did something that meant a lot to me as a photographer. I went and picked up my custom-made portfolio from House of Portfolios. I don't know if that means anybody, anything to anyone who's not a fashion photographer, but what this is, it's a place where you custom design every element of your print book. So you pick the fabric on the outside, on the inside, the way your name's embossed, the thickness, the size, everything about it. And in New York, this is how you get, you know, this is what you do for your portfolio books and they're very very expensive and so for me to be able to go pick up my you know my custom books was significant to me so I have to show you mine there's no pr there's no prints in it yet yeah let's see it let's see Not let's really. see your your choices in materials can you see it okay Here's yeah the book. I see black with black embossed Lindsay Adler on the front yeah okay and then you open it up and it has you know it's all there's my name again on the page nice. and then there's 30 pages of it, but you know this is kind of my, my substantial fashion book. So um, that would just be something that I guess I would say is if you really want to reward yourself, and you, I mean, you literally customize every single element. You can change the fabric on the inside. You can give it lead pages. You can have um, areas in the back to put um, your your leave behinds and, and things like that. Um, House of Portfolios is the standard in New York. So what are, what um, are we looking at? you know, house of cash wise to get one of those things? Um, so you're looking without pictures for for it to be about three fifty four hundred. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. so it's not like horrendous. I mean yeah. you can certainly go up from there. Like you can get ones that are, you know, five, six hundred dollars. But um yeah, I would say if you if you're using somebody like Miller's um to fill that up and have the service it would cost you about five hundred dollars. Okay. But this is what will be shopped around to all of my um, to all my commercial clients, and um, I made a really strong promise to myself to to be more proactive about marketing in the new year. So mm -hmm. I uh, I got that to step up my game a bit, and then also I signed up for um, Agency Access. Agency Access is a, a company that basically provides you all the contact information for all of the decision makers at record labels and all the decision makers at ad agencies and magazines and it's you know it's, it is a couple thousand a year um, and they also had a service to help you out with your marketing um, wow. and so what they do is they give you consultation on the different portfolios you should have how you should separate them out between clients they help you figure out um, who your true target audience would be and then they help you with some of that marketing so I uh, that was my Black Friday gift to myself um, were, were those two things That's awesome. um, <laughs> So that's more in the fashion career, but my gear pick would be, I was actually really excited because Sigma um, recently announced the Sigma 24 to 105 um, 4 0 lens. Mm -hmm. So I'm you know, generally a, a Sigma shooter. I um, mean, all the lenses in my bag are Sigma lenses, and that was something that I felt was missing for a while, uh, particularly when I, I want an all-purpose lens. For, for me, um, you know, I if I'm going on vacation or if I wanted to do street shooting or something for myself especially um, I wanted a lens like that because I'm probably different than you guys I I love photography heart and soul but yeah. a lot of times I don't like to take gear with me on my free time 
Um, I think that it's good for me to separate myself from my work and my inspiration, and then my, I, I don't, I won't, wouldn't have any personal life whatsoever uh, if I didn't try to separate the two. And yeah. so, you know, when I go on vacation, I'm, I booked a vacation for myself in January. Um, I was thinking about not even taking a camera because I was trying to figure out how to, to just decrease the, the amount of you know, gear and weight and distraction I was taking with me. I, I was going to just take my cell phone or look into another like mirrorless point and shoot or something. Yeah. Um, but now that they just came out with a 24 to 105, um, and I got to test it out last week, it was fast, it was sharp, it was relatively lightweight. That would be a lens I know I could take with me, and that would just be the lens I would take on that trip, so I don't have to worry about carrying a lot of gear. Nice, nice. And you, how much? How much is that lens? Do you know? Um, I believe it's nine hundred. Okay. Yeah. Again, an investment though. You're going to keep that lens for several years. It's not like, oh, I got to buy another one next year this time. You're going to keep that for a while. For a while, you'll, it'll be in your bag. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Perfect. Perfect. E two first picks, Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Derek Story, what is your pick of the week? I think since we're doing a portrait show, I'll, I'll do a portrait lens. And uh, you know this lens, Frederick. You just introduced me. Oh, this is the one you, you let me shoot with yesterday, yeah. It is. So I, um, probably my favorite lens in the Micro Four Thirds world is the Olympus 75mm f1.8. And I just have a major crush on that lens uh, because of what I can do with it. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, Micro Four Thirds, you got a smaller sensor. It's so much harder to drop out the backgrounds uh, and get that, you know, that what I call photographic look. And that mm -hmm. lens can do it. It's one of the very few lenses in, in uh, you know, in that format that, that will do it. And uh, it's just gorgeous. And it's, uh, I have two lenses that I think, uh, make me look like a better photographer than I really am. That's one. <laughs> that's one of them, and the other one is my uh, 7200 uh, f2.8, uh, my Canon uh, nice. zoom. Both of those lenses, uh, they make me look better than I really am. So, but, so, I, but we're going to do 75 uh, or the 75 this week. That uh, that 75 uh, f1.8, the Olympus, that is in my Amazon wish list. Hint, yeah. hint, if anybody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> you must you know, have some Lindsay nice bought all kinds of stuff buddy. for herself. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I am a firm believer if you reward yourself, you're going to work hard enough to make sure you earned those rewards. So that was that makes part sense. of the motivation. That makes sense. Yeah, or else what's it for? What's it all for? Cool. All right, guys. My my pick of the week is some. You guys have these expensive picks of the week. Mine is a uh, is free. It's a website from a friend of the show. He's a friend of mine as well. His name's Julio Schiorio. He runs a website called Small Camera Big Picture, and it is focused on smaller cameras, like the smaller mirrorless Panasonics and you know other cameras that let you do more with less gear. Like, Lindsay, you are talking about going on vacation and not bringing a bunch of stuff with you. I would check out his blog just to see the kind of things that you can not bring with you and still do a really good job. So definitely definitely check that out. It's called Small Camera, Big Picture. All right, yeah, folks. I, Go ahead. I think that's great. No, I, th I would say I think that's great because that's something that I definitely want to look into. It, it doesn't have anything to do with me right now professionally, but... I still love photography personally, and I want to. I want to take away that hassle. Um, yeah. of feeling like a lot of gear, so I think that's a great one. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, yeah, and check out Derek's blog as well. He's got the nimblephotographer.com. That is, you know, I'm I'm seeing a trend in these sites that are coming up that that speak to less is more. The whole less is more movement. So yeah, definitely okay. check that out too. All right, and uh, geez, we're at the end of another episode of this week in photo and listeners. At the end of the show, there's an awesome interview that I did with a wonderful photographer. Her name is Krista Miola. She's a boudoir mm -hmm. photographer based in New York, probably a stone's throw away from Lindsay Adler, but definitely check that out. And check out the website, the This Week in Photo website, where you'll, you can see the video of the interview that I did with Krista. So good stuff. All right, folks, end of the show. Lindsay Adler, where would you like folks to go to keep up with you and see some of the stuff that you're working on? Definitely. Um, I would check out my blog, which is blog.lindsayadlerphotography.com, and then my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash lindsayadlerphotography. And I have a bunch of exciting stuff I'll be introducing January 1st, so if you okay. want to check back in then, I think it would be great. 
Oh, I love see the the marketer. Look at that cliffhanger, Derek. Take a note. <laughs> see that. <laughs> awesome. All right, Derek. Story. What about you? Where would you like folks to go to keep up with you? Mine's easy. Uh, the digital photographer. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's the nimble photographer. Uh, Nimblephotographer dot com or the digital story dot com. There you go. I think you should register the I digital just, photographer. I just I just blended them into one. <laughs> I just morphed them. <laughs> <laughs> They're all the same. I love it. I love it. Cool. All right. But well, uh, you. Probably, probably if you morph them uh, in the web browser, it probably won't work very well. So no. it, it'll to, take you to some place. Go else. to the digital story first. <laughs> the digital story or the nimble photographer. .com. Cool. All right, guys uh, and listeners, if you want to keep up with everything in the TWIP universe, you can check us out at thisweekinphoto.com or you can join our community over on Google+. And if you're looking for me, Frederick Van Johnson, you can find me at frederickvan.com or, of course, over on Google+. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off. And that's it.